organocatalysis. How an overlooked type of catalysis is revolutionizing chemical synthesis. Benjamin List, Max Planck Institute für Kohlenforschung. On November 9th, 1989, I was in Berlin, of course. Thank you. Thank you so much. I'm so happy to be here because literally on this very day, 34 years ago, I was one of the fortunate people to be in this beautiful, this amazing city of Berlin. We were all infused with enthusiasm and optimism, you know, much lighter times than nowadays, unfortunately. And it was, everything seemed to be possible. And, and my optimism was, you know, unlimited. It was also perhaps unjustified because all I had to offer at, the, at that time was I had finished high school and yet here I found myself in, in Berlin wanting to understand the world and wanting to change it and make it a better place. So I studied uh, philosophy and chemistry. As you can see, I was not very good in handling firework in 1989. I'm still not very good at it. And over the years, though, I became an expert in chemical synthesis. My target was considered one of the most complicated natural products in existence. And just to remind you, chemical synthesis is kind of the technology with which we make vitamins, fuels, uh, fertilizers, antivirals, vaccines, antibiotics, perfumes, all of these materials that make our life so wonderful and so convenient on this planet. And so while I became aware how powerful chemical synthesis is, I also realized um, that it has its kind of challenges that come along. So it's time consuming. You have to really devote a lot of energy and, and, and sort of time on, on, on chemical synthesis. It is sometimes wasteful in terms of energy, materials. It requires hazardous conditions, toxic metals, uh, very expensive metals, for example. So after finishing my PhD, I decided I want to make chemical synthesis more sustainable, lighter, you know, more efficient. And what better inspiration could be there than nature? And so I looked it at nature, at uh, photosynthesis, in fact. Sorry, I didn't show the first slide. Um, and and I, I really, I cannot envision uh, um, a more impressive chemical transformation than photosynthesis. Very simple transformation. Everybody, even the non-chemist, will understand it. CO2 reacts with water to give, on the one hand, the carbohydrates. This is the stuff we need to eat or the animals that some of us eat. And as a byproduct, oxygen, the gas we need to breathe in one simple chemical transformation. I mean, this is kind of as awe-inspiring as it can be. Probably the most important chemical reaction, at least in our solar system. I wouldn't say in the universe, I don't know about that, but certainly in our solar system from our human perspective. And this is happening in the, in the leaves of plants. In this case, it's a moss. And uh, the carbohydrates that are formed are, are really complex molecules and assembled with great elegance and very uh, awesome efficiency. And, but there's a, a secret ingredient in, in this uh, transformation, and that is what is on the arrow, enzymes. We need enzymes for photosynthesis. In fact, enzymes catalyze all chemical processes in our bodies and in all plants and all animals on the planet. And Enzymes are catalysts, in fact, and this brings me to what clearly is my favorite science, the science of catalysis. I, I, to be honest, I mean, I say it straight away, I cannot imagine anybody researching anything else. I think it's definitely <laughs> the, the coolest, I'm sorry for, you know, now I'm insulting many of you, the coolest thing you, you can do. It's kind of as close as we can ever come to magic, for that matter, right? In principle, a single molecule can mediate a chemical process, let's say A and, a and B react to C, by lowering the energy that is required to bring A and B together. Typically, when you bring molecules together, some, some energy is re, uh, required, and catalysts can provide a, a lower energy pathway. But the beauty comes from the fact that catalysts are not sort of used up in this, in this operation. That means after the chemical process, they have catalyzed, they can do the job again and again and again. In principle, in theory, one single molecule is enough to create an infinite number of useful materials. So very, very uh, powerful 
uh, concept for, for chemical science, but also, of course, as the more economically inclined people have immediately seen, it's, it became a technology. In fact, it's, of course, kind of elegant. You take a little bit of something, you create something very valuable on a huge amount, you have a business case, right? And so not surprising, uh, uh, catalysis became a key technology. I would even I would go that as far as suggesting here the key technology for our life on this planet. Catalysts contribute to roughly a third of the global domestic product, a number that's so ridiculous. It's like 10, like I, I think 30 uh, trillion euros per, per, per year, right? So that's what catalysts provide. I sometimes say catalysts feed, heal, warm, and transport humanity and its goods. And it's also clear, actually, that to tackle the global challenges, and I would say climate change is probably the mother of all the, the problems that we're facing, we will need catalysts uh, to, to solve these problems. And I would just share with you one of those technologies I think everybody should know, like uh, Beethoven's Fifth Symphony or Mona Lisa from Da Vinci. We should know Haber Bosch. Probably some of you have already heard about it. It is probably the most important chemical reaction chemists pursue on the planet, in which we react, and it has been called bread from air, because we use air as a starting material. Nitrogen is actually the main constituent of air. And in, in the Haber-Bosch process, nitrogen reacts with hydrogen in the presence of an iron catalyst to form ammonia. And from ammonia, you can make nitric acid in yet another catalytic process catalyzed by platinum and rhodium, the so-called Oswald process. And both ammonia and nitric acid are sort of the, the basis of all fertilizers. And you can see actually how important fertilizers are when you correlate the ammonia production over the years, we're currently producing humanity roughly 150 million tons per year, consuming 1 to 2 percent of the global energy demand. So you can es estimate how important this reaction is for our life. When you correlate ammonia production with the growth of the world population, and you can see that actually probably without Haber-Bosch, half of you wouldn't be sitting here. We would be maybe two or four billion people, but certainly not eight billion people. So we really, many of us, you know, can thank Haber and Bosch for this amazing uh, discovery. The interesting thing, though, in the context of my talk, sorry, I need to drink a sip of water. Mm. The interesting thing in, in the context of my talk is that, as you can see, both of these steps are, in fact, catalyzed by metals. And Chemists over one century were absolutely convinced that when it comes to their chemical catalysts, you will need metals. There's no problem in using iron. There's plenty of iron, of course, and it's, it's mostly not toxic. But many metals are kind of rare and um, also toxic in, in some cases. Um, and also in textbooks, actually, you could find that when it comes to asymmetric catalysis, where we make these chiral molecules, I don't know if you've heard about them, they behave like object and mirror image, and to make them is very important for medicines because our body can differentiate between these two forms. In textbooks, when I was a graduate student here in Berlin, you could read that uh, you can either use enzymes, like the ones used in photosynthesis, of course, or you can use metal complexes. That was considered the state of the art in the 90s when I was a graduate student. But my ambitions were high, as I've mentioned, and I wanted to develop a general type of catalyst that would catalyze all the difficult reactions that I, I wanted to work on. So I moved to the Scripps Research Institute to work with an MD, uh, a, a medical doctor, actually, Richard Lerner. Unfortunately, he passed away a couple of years ago. And he was a virologist and immunologist, and he has had taught antibodies, which normally are not catalysts, to behave like catalysts. That was a really fascinating concept at the time. It's kind of a bit silent right now. But I had a, a wonderful time with him, and one of my goals was to show you can do this on a gram scale. And this was the first example where we made like 10 grams of a product using uh, a catalytic antibody. But the other task that I, I was assigned to was sort of to understand how his antibodies, how these enzymes actually work. And we had a crystal structure of the, the antibody available to us and I, I inspected the structure. You could really see on an atomic resolution, you know, the, the details of this, of this catalyst. What I found was really shocking for me because there was no metal in the active side. So this antibody catalyzes a very challenging aldol reaction between ketones and aldehydes to give these aldols with very high selectivity, these mirror image selectivity, but it doesn't need a metal, you know. And I was kind of, wow, how is that possible? All it needed was I found was an amino group provided by a lysine residue, that's an am amino acid, 
and an acid group that was a tyrosine, a phenol group that was hydrated. And then the thought came a couple of years later when I became an assistant professor at Scripps at the time in Southern California, if all this enzyme needs is an amino group and an acid, why not use an amino acid? So that was the thought, and proline came to my mind again. I heard about it during my studies here in, in Dahlem. Proline is a natural amino acid. It has all that is needed, right? There's this amino group and there's this acid, so why not using this as a catalyst? And indeed, the very first experiment I tried, uh, as a, I was like 31 years old back in 99, was an aldol reaction, and it turned out proline was a very efficient catalyst. I mean, not so much in terms of, of uh, a catalyst loading 25 mole percent. I said one molecule can pr produce an infinite amount of, of new molecules. In this case, uh, this means one molecule of the catalyst produces four new products. So it's kind of on the weaker side with regard to efficiency, but the enantioselectivity was astonishing. In fact, it, it sort of defined the state of the, the art at the time. I was very excited. Unfortunately, the scientific community was a bit skeptical and they would heavily argue this is not a real catalyst, this is a substoichiometric reagent at best. And then I would say, yeah, that might be true, but there's one thing that you cannot do with your fancy transition metal catalyst, you cannot eat it. And proline, actually, is an edible molecule, right? So don't forget this. We produce it in our own body. So I have some proline today. Let's see. I hope I'll survive. <laughs> I think it's always nice to, you know, remember this is sort of the, the change that this brought about. At the time, I know, there was some, some skepticism, but that quickly changed. In the year 2000, there were maybe five papers, because simultaneously with my work, David McMillan, also in California, discovered uh, related uh, studies. So we had five papers back in 2000, but since then, actually, the field exploded, as they have said, and now there is not a single day on which not five papers, at least in this area, uh, are produced. A field was born, and people were more and more convinced that this actually works. Now there are thousands of groups in the world. There is no chemical or pharmaceutical company not using organocatalysis anymore, the catalysis with small organic molecules. And this is an example I'm really happy to, to share. When our protein-catalyzed aldo reaction was used, to making this aldehyde here, and this is a precursor of darunavir, and for the younger generation, actually, darunavir is an anti-AIDS medic medication, an anti-HIV drug, human immune deficiency virus. This was probably one of the worst pandemics the, the planet has seen. Dozens of millions of people died, and until this day, there is not a single vaccine available. This uh, disease is treated with small molecule drugs, and darunavir is, is one of them designed by medicinal chemists and also made by process chemists. And in this case, actually, they used our proline catalyzed aldo reaction, which is kind of nice, even though I didn't really contribute to the design of this drug. But it's nice to see that our chemistry found some utility to treat viral diseases. And I think, ultimately, this also helped in paving the, ra the, the road to, to Stockholm. But before I end, I would like to share with you a little bit what's happening right now in my laboratory. We have pretty much the most exciting times in my group. We have developed now uh, a new type of organocatalyst. They're arguably more complicated than protein. I probably wouldn't eat those, I have to admit. But they're, they're kind of magic acids. They're very, very strong acids and also very, very reactive. And here goes sort of this skepticism about my early work. We can now use less than one part per million to catalyze aldo reactions. The, the drug agency actually would allow uh, companies to include the catalyst in the drug if, if they wanted to. Nobody would do something like this, of course, but that illustrates to you how small a concentration of the catalyst is now needed to catalyze such reaction. And also, to illustrate this, one kilogram of such a catalyst would be enough to making 388 tons of a pharmaceutical. The world demand of a blockbuster drug is now available with just a kilogram of such a drug. Also, a uh, recent discovery was the catalysis of the narrow to isopipetinol transformation. This reaction was considered impossible by chemists for over 100 years. Now it's possible with these kind of catalysts, and from this uh, product now, we have devised the shortest routes to 3 billion euro uh, uh, molecules, menthol, it's in, in, you put it in, in toothpaste and, and menthol cigarettes and, and chewing gums and so on, <coughs> but also the cannabinoids can now be made in a very, very effective way. And of course, everybody knows they are currently being legalized and we're very excited about 
this uh, discovery. But it will not end without you know, taking a look at, at a wall I want to break or I want to encourage the young generation to break, and that is the splitting of CO2, the simplest of all chemical reactions, one could argue, but also, I would say, the best. It would even be better than photosynthesis. It would be sort of a human-designed photosynthesis. Can we take CO2 out of the atmosphere, use sunlight and maybe organocatalysts to split it into carbon and oxygen. This would be a reaction that would change the world, perhaps more than the falling uh, of the wall uh, in Berlin. And we're working on it very hardly because I want to give the somewhat silly name of my institute a new meaning, Max Planck Institute für Kohlenforschung. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, these are my people. Thank you very much for your kind attention. Thank you.